Hello everyone, it's time to discuss Macedon. Macedon, also called Macedonia, take your pick, was the homeland of Philip II and Alexander the Great. Famously, Alexander took the armies that his father had mustered and more or less conquered the world, at least by the standards of the 4th century BCE. In this video, what I want to do is highlight the role of the various cities within the Macedonian Kingdom and give you a general picture of what they were like, where they were, and how they contributed to the whole of Macedon. That being said, I think that we need quite a bit of context before we get to that point since Macedon is quite unlike the other Greek states we've studied to this point. Macedon was not nearly so tribal as Epirus or Thessaly, and it also was far from a polis with a surrounding area. It was a territorial kingdom much more similar to what we see in later periods, say in the Middle Ages, or at least later Middle Ages, and then in the early modern period. So today I'd like to take a look at that and hopefully give you a good general feel for what Macedon was like and what cities you could find there during the archaic, classical, and Hellenistic periods. When compared to many other parts of the Greek world, one thing that stands out about Macedon is that it was quite a bit larger. And that's significant because this means that it has more total mileage. And with that comes the possibility of supporting a larger population and also producing more in terms of agricultural products, um, natural resources, etc. Macedon is a pretty varied place. You have tall mountains. Mount Olympus in the south is the prime example of that. You also have plains which are relatively flat and which made them rather vulnerable to invasion. And you also have a number of rivers which both provided for irrigation and also were mostly navigable, so this facilitated trade. While the farmland of Macedon wasn't anything crazy, it wasn't anything like the Carthaginian homeland in Tunisia, but it was relatively good land, better than most in Greece, and for that reason, this would allow Macedon to ultimately sustain a relatively large population by the standards of the Greek world. On the southern border of Macedon, this is more or less marked by Mount Olympus and the range around it, and to the south of this mountain chain, of course, is Thessaly. To the north is Thrace, and now we are finally out of the Greek world. Thrace is distinctly non-Greek, although it still has a few features of Greek civilization, and certainly there was a lot of interaction between the Greeks and Thracians, so they were hardly strangers, but the Thracians are distinctly non-Greek. The same goes for the Illyrians of the Northwest, and both the Thracians and the Illyrians would pose major threats to Macedon, and I would say that their invasions are one of, if not the key reasons why Macedon didn't develop earlier. The area of the Chalcides Peninsula, seen on the eastern side of Macedon here, it looks like it is a hand with three fingers, or maybe a claw or paw of some kind. This is a peripheral area to Macedon, and for most of Macedonian history, this was not part of the kingdom. However, it will become an integral part in the time of Philip II. Um, this area was originally colonized by the Greeks, and later on, after the Macedonians acquired it, will give excellent sea access to the Macedonians as they begin to try to expand out of Europe and also to engage in naval activities and large-scale trade. The Macedonian Kingdom, at least if our sources are to be believed, was founded around 700 or so BCE by a dynasty called the Argeids. Supposedly the name derived from the name of Argos because their founders were relatives of King Timonus of Argos. We've already talked about the lot of Timonus in a previous video on Argos, so you should be familiar with that story. There are a few different versions of the story of the foundation of the Argeid dynasty in Macedon. In one of them, it was actually Timonus's son, Carinus, who fled from Argos after a dynastic dispute and went straight to Macedon and got things going at that time. Another thing to keep in mind with King Timonus, of course, is that just like all of the other Argive kings, we have no firm dates whatsoever. So even if he was a historical person, we really don't know when he lived. So trying to decide between the Karen story and the one I'm about to tell 
based on dating is at this juncture not really possible. Another version of the story recorded in Herodotus states that three brothers, including the man who would go on to become Perdiccas I of Macedon, fled from Argos. These would have been perhaps great-grandsons of Timonus. And at first they took refuge with the Illyrians, and then later on they moved to the east and they settled in Macedonia, Macedon, which at this time was relatively uninhabited. They conquered the locals and slowly but surely this emerged into a kingdom by around 700 BCE. Either way, whether it was founded by Carinus or by, I guess, his grandson or great-grandson uh, Perdiccas I, at any rate, this family does trace its roots back to Argos, and it was always the Argia dynasty which ruled Macedon throughout the Archaic and Classical periods. Whenever there were civil wars, all of the contenders were members of the Argiad family, or at least people representing the Argiads, if they were representing a minor, for instance. And there were civil wars aplenty, we won't get into any of them because they are somewhat complex, poorly recorded, and we're trying to get through this without stacking Olympia, Olympus on Pelion. The Greekness of the Macedonians was questioned in later periods. Um, this was largely exacerbated by the fact that Macedon Medes, we won't go into that in too much detail, but given how flat Macedon is facing Thrace, you can understand that if you cross with a massive Persian army, that it would be very difficult for the Macedonians to resist. So Alexander I of Macedon surrendered and cooperated for the most part. We'll get back into that in due time. And because their Greekness was challenged, they also had some dialectical differences. The Argiads themselves and also the other aristocrats strove very hard to cultivate a very Greek image. They made sure that they did not share the local accent, they made sure that they were well read, and they also tried to sponsor Greek art and compete in things like the Olympics as often as possible. So that way, by acting Greek, they would show that they were in fact Greek, even though they were on the periphery of the Greek world. Let's add another quick wrinkle of complexity into the mix. Macedon, which we just saw, the Argiad side of it, is the main Macedon that we think of. However, it was not necessarily the only game in town for most of the Archaic and Classical periods. There was a second Macedonian kingdom in existence which was only crushed maybe early in Philip's reign. I'm talking of Lynchestis, also sometimes called Lynchestian Macedon or Upper Macedonia. The area which composed this kingdom is now currently divided between Greece, Macedonia, and Albania. A lot of times in these modern debates over who deserves credit for ancient stuff, um, Macedonia especially, and maybe Albania, will try to claim credit for being the real Macedonian homeland. If we're talking about the homeland of the Argeids, that, that is all within the boundaries of Greece today. However, it is true that Lincestian Macedonia is divided between three different countries. So the exact boundaries of Macedonia in ancient terms are not necessarily all kept within Greece or the modern country Macedonia, which in fact doesn't have that much of ancient Macedonia within it. The Lincestai were closely related to the Molossians of Epirus. We're not sure exactly how, but it's not implausible to think that the relationships of the Lincestai with the Molossians helped to cultivate the relationship that Philip II had with them, which led to Philip's marriage to Olympias. And then, of course, Philip's basic management of Epiros and controlling the throne through his brother-in-law, Alexander the Molossian. So perhaps the Lincestians, as one of their last acts, um, really either willingly or unwillingly facilitated Philip's control of the Northwest. The Lincestian rulers are people we don't know that much about. Some scholars will sometimes look at various Macedonian aristocrats, such as Ptolemy, and try to speculate as to whether he may have had royal blood from Lincestis. We simply don't really know. I mean, there are a few theories going that different successor generals were actually uh, the descendants of the Lincestian line, but again, um, that line was largely taken out by Philip, and he probably intermarried with whoever was left at some point, I would imagine. The Lincestai kings 
claim descent from the Corinthian Bacchidae of the 7th century. It's not impossible. Um, from all appearances, Macedon was not very thickly populated at the time, and with the threat from Illyria and Thrace materializing, people were looking for strong leaders. Someone who could come from a place like Corinth or even Argos with a small following, a small band of warriors, and perhaps make a name for himself and claim to be king in, protection, in exchange for protection. So the story is not inherently implausible, even if it does also smack of this need for the people of the north to defend their Greekness against their fellow Greeks. Lynchestus was able to maintain his independence all the way until the time of Amentas IV or Philip II. So this means that they were only subdued in the 360s or 350s, and that during the time of even Alexander the Great, if you were to go up to one of the soldiers or successor generals and ask them about Lynchestus, they would know exactly what you're talking about, and maybe some of them would be from that area or claim descent from one of the noble or royal houses of Lynchestia. Macedonian politics are a debated topic. Scholars are not sure exactly the nature of the Macedonian constitution. We know some of the organs of the Macedonian political system, but we don't really know the exact balance of power. We know that there was a strong aristocracy. Its role is not altogether clear. It's not clear whether it served at the behest of the king and held a bunch of land, or whether it had a more formalized role. There's also an army assembly where all the men under arms were allowed to vote on things. These army assemblies, many scholars think they were sovereign. However, they only got to vote up or down on proposals by the king. So their powers were quite limited, and one imagines the king would only bring things to vote that he knew would pass. And we also have the monarchy headed by the Argia dynasty. So either Macedon was something of a constitutional monarchy where the aristocrats and army assembly had some real power, or else it was something of an autocracy with a couple of rubber stamps. Well, one rubber stamp, the assembly, and then a sort of officer corps to back up the monarchy in the form of the aristocracy. In Macedon, um, it took a while for urbanization to occur, and it remained limited for a while. This was also largely due to Thracian and Illyrian incursions, as was, is similar to the case of Epirus. Macedonian royal cities were not poles. There were poles in what was later part of the Macedonian kingdom, however, but those would be just your typical Greek colonies in places like the Chalcides. The Greek poles on the coast, especially in the Chalcides, were important trade and cultural centers, and this is where the Macedonians would be able to keep abreast of developments in the more settled parts of the Greek world. One scholar has described Macedon famously as, quote, an absolute monarchy tempered by assassination. That's a pretty reasonable guess of how things worked, and it's consistent with what we see in Macedonian history. So I will assume that the scholar was correct on that. That being said, we don't have any firm testimony as to how the system really was supposed to work and then the exact powers that say the army assembly actually had. So it is a bit of guesswork, but absolute monarchy tempered by assassination seems like a pretty good formulation which explains how the Macedonian state worked in practice. The story of Macedon before Philip II is a tale of unrealized potential. Macedon had pretty good farmland, abundant timber, which they could trade to the Athenians and make quite a bit of silver. And they also had gold mines that they began to develop and explore as early as the fifth century. So in theory, Macedon could have emerged as a major player in the Greek world as early as maybe the mid fifth century had things just worked out politically and there been stability. However, other people also realized that, and they knew that if Macedon was ever able to really marshal all their resources and um, keep it all together under a stable monarchy, that the freedom of the other Greeks would be very much threatened. It would be hard to stand up to something with that kind of resource base. So a lot of their neighbors, either on purpose or through their actions um, inadvertently, did their utmost to hold back Macedonian development. Athens did so as a matter of active policy, 
as they would often find a discontent prince and wait for the king to die and then give that prince a backing so that he could start a civil war. This happened on a number of occasions from the 5th century on. The Illyrians often invaded, and because Macedonian Argead kings were warrior kings, they fought in the ranks, and since the Illyrians often won these battles, there were at least a few Macedonian monarchs who were slain in combat with the Illyrians. Same thing could occur with the Thracians, of course. There were two kings who seemed to have a good deal of insight into what it would take to develop Macedon into a major power. These two earlier kings are Alexander I, who had a long reign between 498 and 454. He famously Medized. However, Herodotus records that Alexander managed to get rid of the stigma of his Medizing by explaining the situation to the other Greeks and also feeding them secret intel about Xerxes' intentions. He later rebelled after the Persian defeat at Plataea, and it seems that because of Alexander's deft handling of the optics of Medizing, that Macedon incurred no lasting stigma, and the other Greeks more or less understood why they had done what they did, and uh, wasn't really a problem in the long run. Alexander also seems to have started to develop a lot of different places, um, including Pella, that may have been one that he started to develop more. There's also Archelaus I, who only ruled for about 14 years. So he ruled from the, at 413 to 399, the late stages of the Peloponnesian War, and into the early 4th century. Archelaus was another good state builder, and had he lived longer, no doubt he was planning to do some of the civil reforms that Philip II had in mind. Archelaus was famous throughout Greece as well, and in fact, he was so famous as a patron of the arts that the Athenian playwright Euripides, after the Peloponnesian War, decided to move to Macedon and spent his final years living at court with Archelaus. They became good friends, and they would often go hunt together and just talk about poetry and the theater. The key figure in Macedonian history was not Alexander, it was Philip II, his father. Philip II importantly decided that the only way that Macedon would ever have long-term security and prosperity was if it were to build an army which could hold off all of its enemies and enable it to achieve both stability and expansion. Therefore, he used all of the knowledge he gained while he was a hostage at Thebes to reform the army. Instead of trying to emulate the hoplite formations of southern Greece, something that Macedonia had been doing and doing very poorly for a long time, he instead created a new battlefield formation, the Pike Phalanx. It looked a lot like the hoplite phalanx, but the emphasis was on a very long spear that was about 18 feet long, maybe 20, I've heard 18 or 21, depending on who you ask. Either way, much longer than the seven foot or so hoplite spear. They would carry much smaller shields because the point was to have this massive formation of spears coming at you as a pinning force. Then you would have light infantry to protect the flanks of this phalanx, which you couldn't possibly hit head on, but they would be vulnerable if you got them from behind. So you'd have lighter infantry, including some hoplite mercenaries, to protect the phalanx. So you'd use the phalanx to pin and then other units to make sure the phalanx could do what it was supposed to do. Once an enemy was sufficiently pinned, or if there was a gap in their lines, you could then use the cavalry. And there were several types of cavalry in the Macedonian force. The most famous were the companion cavalry, which were heavily armed and used as the decisive blow. Most of the companions were men of relatively high birth and wealth who would ride beside the king or sometimes the crown prince. Another thing that Philip did that other Greeks were starting to figure out but didn't quite have the resources to do on a grand scale was to master siege warfare. Before this, the Athenians with their blockades and extended stays in places that they could afford through all of their um, monetary reserves had been the masters of siege warfare, but that wasn't a very efficient means. So Philip developed a professional corps of siege engineers and he would always have a siege train with him, something that after Philip would become a standard part of pretty much every ancient and medieval army. Philip 
captured and founded key cities throughout Macedon and also the larger Greek world. Famously, he would subdue Thessaly. He was effectively the power behind the throne in Ephesus, and he also subdued large chunks of Thrace. Famously, of course, he subdued a large number of Greek poles. One of the points of Philip's strategy was to use marriage as a way to both build internal support and to build external alliances. At various points, he would marry the daughters of leading aristocrats in Macedon to avoid having political rivals. He could also reward some of his aristocrats with things like commands, so that way they would feel they were being properly utilized. He could also give them money or lands or any number of things. His marriages, however, were absolutely vital to building these kinds of relationships he needed with people like the Illyrians. More to the point, now that Philip had stability and some degree of peace, if there was there were wars, he at least was usually on the offensive. And if he start if he didn't start the war, he'd still conquer stuff anyway. So he steadily was expanding, and this meant that he now had the wherewithal and the manpower to focus on developing Macedon's resources. To this end, he will make sure that Macedon is pumping out gold and also mending its own coinage. They're also now making sure that they always profit off their resources rather than being exploited by outside powers like Athens. Another thing that Philip does, although some have argued it was actually his older brother who instituted this before Philip came to the throne, was the institution of the royal pages. This institution would have young men, both young princes and young aristocrats, serve effectively as um, interns for the king. And while at court, they would learn things like court etiquette, um, the business of governing, and generalship. So they would, by the time that they were done hanging out with Philip or Alexander, be capable of serving as officers of Macedon in various capacities. And this is the closest thing to professional officer training that the ancient world produces at this time. So while this is hardly a formalized system comparable to something like West Point, it is a large leap beyond what had come before. To give you a sense of how effective this actually was, in his own time, when he's talking about men of his own generation who were his generals, Philip famously said that the only competent general he had was Parmenian. Now, that is a harsh critique of both Antipater and Antigonus the One-Eyed, both of whom also served Philip quite well, but it does show you that there weren't that many good generals of Philip's generation. By the time that the generation that was about 10 years younger than him started to come of age and down to the time of Alexander and beyond, we see that the royal pages are really paying off as one excellent general and governor after another emerges in the successor period. And even before that, when Alexander's conquering Persia, there are a number of officers who are highly capable that he can lean on at any given time. So Philip II's reforms make Macedon what it was. In short, during his 23 or so years on the throne from 359 to 336, Philip fulfilled the potential of Macedon, something that his ancestors had dreamt of for a while. He was able to successfully fend off all attempts from his enemies to slow him down. Some of these enemies were internal. He actually came to power by usurping his nephew. He was supposed to serve as regent, but after he won a few battles with his reformed army, the Macedonian army assembly voted for him to just become king. This may be one instance where this was the will of the people. It's also possible that Philip just asked them, hey, would you like to have me as king instead of my toddler nephew? So he came to power that way. Athens feared Philip, and while there was dissension in Athens about what to do, for the most part, Athens was opposed to Philip, and all the debates were on exactly how to oppose him. Demosthenes famously was a rabid hater of all things Philip, and delivered speeches which were savage attacks on Philip called the Philippics. The term Philippic to this day is a very savage attack on someone, including an attack on their character. So despite all of the speeches of Demosthenes calling Philip an uncultured barbarian and a drunk and all of that, Philip was almost entirely successful with everything he did in his career as king. 
Every time Athens would dispatch a relief force for one of their allies, Philip was always one step ahead of them. The force would arrive only to find that it was too late and that Philip had already captured the place, or that they had been distracted and they had bitten for some bait. Philip was elsewhere getting stuff done. Philip only had two military affairs which should be described as failures. One of them I refuse to count as a defeat. There was one time where he was laying siege to Perinthus, located in the northeastern corner of Europe, at least on this map. You can see it there south of Byzantium. And he had to abandon the siege because of an Athenian landing elsewhere. That's not really a defeat. The other defeat was where he marched into a valley and a general named Onomarchus had set up a bunch of siege equipment in Ballastai and he let loose a fusillade which inflicted casualties on Philip's men and routed them. Eventually, of course, Philip defeated him and conquered his city. So Philip only ever lost one battle legitimately, although he did fight in the front lines just like previous kings, and during that time he became crippled in his leg. He took a massive blow from, I believe it was a Thracian, and so he would always walk with a limp. His leg never healed right, and he also lost an eye. So Philip did pay for his achievements, but achievements they were indeed, and his victories were all rather clear. If you look at this area in kind of the, I guess, orangey color here, um, this is sort of the Macedonian heartland during the time of Philip II. And it, it probably, it's probably double what he inherited, even just looking at that area. If you look at that lighter color of salmon or whatever it's supposed to be, that's Thrace, more or less. And he conquered all of that, at least not entirely, but mostly. Um, actually, one of the successor generals will spend his entire career trying to keep this area subdued, a man named Lysimachus. There's also Molossia, this being Epirus, which he basically controls more or less, not directly. He also is the hegemon or Tagus of Thessaly from an early date, so he has all the power of Thessaly. And in theory, almost all of the Greek stakes except for Sparta join in the League of Corinth after the Battle of Chironea, where he defeats an alliance led by Thebes and Athens. So Philip II basically conquered Europe, at least the part of Europe that the Greeks cared about, and it was his intention to invade Persia in order to avenge the Persian Wars. This was both to wipe away whatever remaining stain there was from his ancestors' medizing, but also a good way to unite the Greeks and get a bunch of volunteers for his force, although he didn't get as many as he wanted. And this was a great excuse to go plunder and hopefully conquer some things in Asia. Unlikely Philip dreamt of conquering all of Asia, but certainly he had some territorial ambitions. However, he was assassinated at a wedding, one of his many weddings, this time to a young woman named Cleopatra, who was the daughter of a major general. He was assassinated because there was a guy there who had been sexually assaulted by the father of the bride at a previous on a previous occasion, and Philip had refused to help the young man because he needed the father, Attalus, as a political ally. So in order to avenge his honor, the young man waited till the wedding and then murdered Philip. So again, autocracy tempered by assassination. And as always with anything Greek, Roman, or otherwise, never ever underestimate the ego and desperation of aristocrats. They will not tolerate any insults to their honor, and any insult results in a dagger to the back, almost immediately. After Philip's death, Alexander took a couple of years to consolidate his position at home. He had to put down a few revolts, destroy the city of Thebes, and then he was ready to invade the Persian Empire. In just an 11-year span from 334 to 323, he did exactly that. And in fact, his conquest of Persia was actually basically complete by about 326. So it was really less than 10 years for him to conquer all of Persia and even stretch out into what was then called India, but which today we'd consider Pakistan. He crossed the Indus River and got a little deeper than that before his army started to mutiny and he had to turn around for home. During Alexander's conquest, his Macedonian army, that is the army that Philip had built, was completely dominant and Alexander won every single battle that he fought. Some of them were harder than others, 
and these battles include a wide variety of circumstances. Some battles were field battles against armies which were much larger, such as Gagamela. Others were involved sieges, such as Tyre. And you also had battles such as the Hydaspes, where he had to cross a fairly substantial river in the face of an enemy with war elephants. So this army clearly was institutionally dominant and superior to everything else on the face of the earth at that time. Now, um, when Alexander died in 323, he was without a clear heir. He had a son who was born a few weeks after his death. However, this son's mother was Bactrian, meaning that many of the Macedonian generals were not too keen on accepting the baby as a legitimate king, and therefore they engaged in a large-scale civil war, which lasted for only about 50 years or so. The reason why it lasted so long is that most of the successors, like Alexander himself, were only in their early 30s, and some of them would last a fairly long time. And basically, they fought for the empire for the rest of their lives. Their sons and grandsons would settle down and just rule the Hellenistic kingdoms that they were left by their fathers, but uh, the successors themselves, that first generation, were not content with what they had, and they waged literally half a century of war over an empire that Alexander built in about seven or eight years. By 281, there were three main successor kingdoms left, as well as some smaller ones we won't get into, but Macedon, the Seleucid Empire, and Ptolemaic Egypt. In the future, we'll come back to talk about the Seleucids and Ptolemies, but for now, we're just going to focus on Macedon. To give you a visual sense of the exact scope of Alexander's conquest and why he is universally called the Great, with the exception of John D. Granger for whatever reason. Um, if you look at, in the far west, Greece, uh, or Macedon, that's what Philip started with. And as we saw, he expanded Macedon massively. So a lot of this was not fully under Alexander's control, at least not the same, to the same degree that, say, the heartland of Macedon was. And then he uses the resources from this little corner of the world and conquers this massive expanse. While he didn't literally conquer the world, if you think about what was possible at this time and how much time he had, Alexander probably came closer than anyone else to actually conquering the world in a meaningful sense. There were also uh, rumors later on that Alexander planned to... Um, get his troops together, and then march on Carthage and Italy and add those areas to his empire as well. Or that he might try to go east again and penetrate deeper into India this time. He also was planning a quick incursion into Arabia at the time of his death. So had Alexander lived even a few more years, there's no telling how big this empire could have gotten. Hellenistic Macedon, to put it simply, was effectively Philip's Macedon without Philip or the Argians. During the early Hellenistic period, Macedon changed hands several times, but for most of that period it was ruled by the Antipatrids, starting with Antipater, the regent who ruled while Alexander was away, and his son Cassander. Cassander is someone who will come up a lot as we go forward. He was largely painted as a bad guy in later history because of his role in killing Alexander's son, Alexander IV, However, as we'll see, if we're looking at Cassander just as a king of Macedon, he's actually one of the greatest ever. After Cassander, his children were all sickly and they all died of some terrible disease. And after that point, the Antigonids under Demetrius the besieger and then his successor Antigonus II, Gennadus, were able to establish the Antigonid dynasty, which ruled from 294 down until 168 when the Romans came. So Hellenistic Macedon, as I said, territorially and institutionally was very much Philip's Macedon. It was never quite as dominant, however, due to increasing organization in Greece, the formation of the Aetolian and Achaean leagues enabled them to produce armies which were large enough and well organized enough to really give the Macedonians fits. They also started to adopt some of the Macedonian techniques for war so there was military parity, at least when the numbers were one-on-one. -on -one. And another factor which hurt Macedon and also all of the Greeks, to be fair, uh, 
was some degree of depopulation due to the colonization by Greeks and Macedonians of all of the various kingdoms of the East, including the Kingdom of Pergamon, which you see here, one of the minor ones I said we're not going to talk about, the Seleucid Empire, which was huge, uh, took the vast majority, and also Ptolemaic Egypt took in quite a number of Greek colonists, especially at Alexandria. We'll start our exploration of Macedon and try to go in order of when these cities were founded. With some of these cities, we don't really have a very clear indication of their date of foundation, so I'm engaging in a little bit of guesswork here. But I think this order should work, and this will allow us to intersperse Macedonian sites with Greek sites to show how all of these were eventually woven together into one coherent kingdom. We'll start out with the small polis of Stagira. This was founded in 655 by Ionians from the island of Andros. During the 5th century, Athens forced Stagira to join the Delian League. It then revolted and sided with Sparta during the campaigns of Brasidas. Later, it was the birthplace of the philosopher Aristotle, who first started out as the son of Philip II's court doctor and then went to get his education in Athens, where he became a philosopher and one of the key pupils of Plato. Later on, Aristotle had returned to the Macedonian court, and Philip destroyed Aristotle's home city of Stagira. However, as a favor to Aristotle in return for Aristotle agreeing to be tutor to Alexander and the royal pages, Philip rebuilt the city in grand style, freeing all of the citizens who had been taken into slavery during the city's fall, building an aqueduct, and also erecting two shrines to Demeter. There is a modern village which also bears the name of Stagira and has a statue of Aristotle within five miles of the ruins of ancient Stagira. Next up is Olynthus. Olynthus is located near the neck of the westernmost finger of the Chalcides. If you remember, the Chalcides is that little piece of land which has sort of a round part at the top and then it looks like three fingers. It kind of looks like a hand with the pinky and thumb missing. Well, Olynthus controls the entrance to one of the three fingers, the one most western. This city was settled at some point during the 7th century, but it was then overrun by the Thracians who had been driven off by Alexander I. The Persian governor Artabasdus, when the Persians briefly controlled Macedon, embarked on a campaign to kill most of the Thracians and resettle the Greeks. However, we have archaeological evidence which shows that the Thracians were not completely removed, as some of our sources claim. So Thracians did remain in the area and apparently became integrated in some fashion. In 423, Olynthus became the head of the so-called Chalcidian League, which was formed with the express purpose of resisting Athens. It appears that Olynthus was the largest and most powerful state in this region, and so it became the natural hegemon of this locality. Olynthus was probably the most important ally in the struggle to the Spartan general Brasidas, who was operating far from home with limited funds and relied very heavily on local levies in order to try to pry the Athenians out of Thrace and Macedon. Olynthus was the hegemon of 30 plus other polis in this area by the early 4th century. Its league was officially dissolved in 379 but immediately reformed, and it eventually aligned with Athens against Philip. However, Philip was able to capture the city. We have some famous orations called the Olynthiacs by Demosthenes where he lambasts his countrymen for being too slow to deal with Philip. Olynthus will remain a major bone of contention between Athens and Philip for a couple of decades. Here are some images of the remains of Olynthus. Olynthus has a number of mosaic floors which have been preserved, and this gives us some idea about the evolution of these. Uh, these mosaic floors became popular later in Greek history, so starting in the late classical period, and this was something that the Romans would adopt and do on a much larger scale. To the right is the so-called Bulletarian of Olynthus. This would have been a political meeting space. 
However, not all that much remains of it now. Another Greek polis located in the Chalcides is Potidaea. This polis was founded in 600 by Corinthian colonists, and it was located at the narrowest point in the westernmost finger of the Chalcides. Also, this little peninsula is known as the Pauline Peninsula, in case any of you are wondering about the precise terminology. Potidaea was able to hold firm against a Persian siege in 479. Many scholars think this was due to a tsunami or some other event. There is a precise term, a precise category of tsunami that I can't recall, which is generally held to have been responsible for the Persian failure to seize the city. More famously, Potidaea became a member of the Delian League, at first willingly, and then became embroiled in the conflict between Athens and Corinth, which would eventually break out into the Peloponnesian War. Now, as a loyal colony of Corinth, Potidaea sided with Corinth during this conflict and revolted. This meant that Athens laid siege in 432, and it would take two years to reduce the Potidaeans. The exact relationship between Potidaea and Corinth is somewhat complex, as Potidaea was largely autonomous, yet their chief magistrate was effectively a governor dispatched from Corinth each year. That must have been very awkward at the time when Potidaea was also an eager ally of Athens in the early years of the Delian League. It's a very uncomfortable fit, I would have to think. This two-year siege was long and expensive, but the Athenians eventually did prevail. This was despite an early outbreak of the plague among the besieging army. The Athenian plague mostly is known for its effect at Athens, but it also broke out among the men in their camp laying siege to Potidaea. The city became independent after the Peloponnesian War, and in fact it may have even been liberated by Brasidas. It was then retaken by Athens in 363 as it began to recover. However, Philip II came into the Chalcedes in force in the 350s, and destroyed the city entirely in 356, which was, as we'll see, a pretty significant year in his life. Finally, we now arrive at the original capital city of the Macedonian Kingdom. There's a good chance this city actually predates many of the polis we've already discussed, but I cannot find a firm foundation date for Agiae. The city is the ancient capital of Macedon, and even after the capital was transferred to Pella, it would remain as the burial site of the Argead kings and something like a ceremonial um, capital as well. Some of the tombs here, some of the royal tombs, have been disturbed over time by tomb raiders, but tomb two was unfound by Laura Croft, and we have been able to examine it in a great deal of detail. The consensus right now is that Tomb 2 is in fact the tomb of Philip II. We also know that this is the city where Philip II was assassinated at the wedding in 336, so his body would not have needed to be moved very far. The remains match up with Philip, and we've been able to extract DNA and do a physical reconstruction of what he would have looked like during his lifetime. Um, and it's a pretty interesting picture. You should probably look it up if you are interested in it. But at any rate, um, it matches with Philip in terms of his age, wear and tear, injuries, and all of that. Um, there aren't very many grave goods there, but there are some which all date to the period of Philip. So it seems like a pretty good match. There are other scholars who made the case for Tomb 1, but their evidence is a good deal weaker. There's also a massive palace at Agiae. The palace seems to have been built by Philip II. And this meant that when the king was in residence at Agiae, that he could govern from here as effectively as he could at the newer center at Pella. The palace here, so far as we can tell, is the largest building in the classical period, in terms of the square footage of it. In terms of its impressiveness, it isn't quite up to the standards of the Athenian Acropolis, but it's pretty close in terms of the complexity on display or at least that is the consensus of many archaeologists who have looked at this. Currently, there are reconstruction efforts to rebuild the palace and make it look like its original form. It's possible that the palace at Agiae once looked something like this. 
it would have been an imposing facade built on a slight elevation, which had a massive central courtyard, which would make it very Mediterranean in its design. So it would be designed to deal with hot summers. Although of course it's a good deal further north than most of the rest of Greece. So whether this was actually needed in the same way is I guess somewhat debatable. But at any rate, uh, this is what scholars think that the palace at Agiae looked like during its prime. While we're talking about Macedonian capitals, let's look at the city of Pella, the better known of the two capitals of the Macedonian kings. Pella was an inland city, but one which had a navigable inlet to the Thermaic Gulf. This inlet has since silted up and is no longer usable. The terrain around Pella is marshy, but the marshes are not so deep that you can't simply walk through them in any season. So this means that it has some defensibility, yet it is easily accessible, or at least relatively easily accessible. In terms of its relation to the rest of Macedon, it's also pretty close to the Chalcides, which is the area of Macedon most likely to revolt since the people there are primarily Greek colonists. It also is facing south, the area direction toward which Philip wants to expand, and it is within reasonable marching or sailing distance of pretty much any of Philip's possessions. So it's actually a very well-sighted city and the marshiness of it does not make it unhealthy. So that is a good balance to have. It's sort of the best of all worlds, a perfect compromise position. By 400 or so, Pella had become the largest Macedonian city. The city received a special royal largesse from kings such as Archelaus I, Philip II, and Cassander. Cassander, interestingly enough, also founded a couple of other major cities, so his largesse here is especially interesting. Pella was later sacked by the Romans in 168. However, it quickly recovered and retained its administrative role under Roman governance. Over time, it declined. And later on, Augustus created a Roman colony here, so Roman citizens moved here and revitalized the city. However, it slowly declined away to nothing as most of the residents moved a little bit west to another site. And by the fourth century CE, the site was more or less abandoned completely. Here are some more pictures of Pella. The scene on the left is a hunting scene. Hunting was a favorite activity of most aristocrats in the ancient world, but one which the Macedonian aristocrats seem to enjoy a little bit more than most of their fellow Greeks. There are a lot of examples from around the Macedonian world where different kings or would-be kings will use these kinds of scenes as ways to establish a connection with some famous figure. One famous example is where Craterus portrays himself hunting alongside of Alexander the Great. And he would have had that commissioned fairly early on in the successor period since he died about two years into it. And that became a standard thing for, say, the successor generals to do is to portray themselves on the hunt with Alexander. Whether or not a lot of these guys actually did get the hunt with Alexander is unknown, but it's not altogether unlikely. To the right is a picture of the Agora of Pella. This would have been one of the avenues along which there would have been shops and other things that people could purchase goods and services. We'll leave Pella by taking a long look at this mosaic floor. As I mentioned, mosaic floors were becoming the norm by the late classical period. And Pella was one of the larger sites in Macedon. So it should come as no surprise that one of the larger mosaic floors you can find anywhere is right there in Pella. You see the cap, the columns in the background. This was clearly the heart of the city probably at we're probably at or near the palace right now looking at this scene another major urban center in macedon was pydna which started out as a greek polis the precise date of its foundation is not clear but by the sixth century pydna had achieved enough wealth and importance to issue its own coinage there are two different sites which are called pydna and where residents of this city lived at various times. There's the coastal site, which I'll call the main site, and then the inland site, which is today's Kitros.
Pydna, the coastal one, the original, was captured in a joint Athenian-Macedonian operation in 410. How the Athenians found the extra manpower to engage in this in 410, when they were literally fighting for their lives against Sparta, is not altogether clear, but I guess they needed to win over the favor of Archelaus I, and that was one way to do it, is to help them capture a city in exchange for resources. Later on, the Athenians took the city away from Macedon, but Philip recaptured it in 357. In the meantime, one of Archelaus's moves was to order the city to move inland, but then um, very soon after it was moved back to the coast. Pydna played two key roles in later times, neither of which it probably wanted. First of all, this is the city that Olympias took refuge in during her war with Cassander, but she decided to take refuge here without stocking provisions for her army, so Cassander was able to besiege her, and then she was forced to surrender, and it was here that she was executed. Olympias, of course, is the mother of Alexander, and she was the grandmother and guardian of Alexander IV. The Battle of Pydna was fought here in 168, and this is where Rome ended Macedonian independence. So another thing that no Greek or Macedonian city would want as its legacy, but that is what happened there. Next up, we have another Greek polis. This time, it is Amphipolis, one of the best-known cities from the region. Interestingly enough, Amphipolis, while it does help to control the Chalcides, is located to the northeast of the Chalcides and really does more to open up onto Thrace and serve as a waypoint for ships coming out of the Bosporus and toward Athens. Most likely it was founded primarily to give Athens a little bit more control over the grain routes they needed to stay supplied. The Athenians have been trying to plant a colony here for a couple of decades and it had a few failed attempts before the general Hagnon pulled it off in 437. Despite the fact that most of the colonists were Athenian, the Amphip Amphipolitans decided that it was a good idea to revolt in 422 and join Sparta. This is during the famous campaign of Brasidas. This is the campaign which lost Thucydides his position at Athens and forced him to go into exile. He was serving as general, he had a small squadron of ships, and he was unable to prevent Amphipolis from defecting or to recapture it, so the Athenian Ecclesia voted for him to go into exile. Later they sent the politician Cleon to the area, and he engaged in a battle with Brasidas, where both men were killed. After that, both Athens and Sparta were willing to make peace. This led to the Peace of Nicias in 421, which lasted for about eight years, and was basically the intermission of the Peloponnesian War. Athens, however, never accepted the loss of Amphipolis, and for many decades, they were very much dedicated to trying to find a way to retake the city and make it part of their realm. The city, however, was able to resist Athenian efforts pretty successfully, all the way down until 357, when they lost their independence to Philip II. Possession of Amphipolis then became a source of friction between Athens and Philip. Athens had not given up on their claim to Amphipolis, and nearly any time they would intervene against Philip, one of their tertiary objectives was almost always trying to get back into Amphipolis. One distinction that Amphipolis has, one source of notoriety, is that it was the last residence of Alexander IV and his mother Roxana before their execution in 309 by the orders of Cassander. Here is another brief view of what the ruins of Amphipolis look like, just so you can get a good visualization of what was there. And now we move south to the city of Philippi. Originally founded by Thasian colonists in 360 as the city of Crenides, which translates into springs, this city was planted near the foot of Mount Orbelus to control local gold mines. Now, I'm sure that the local springs were a major benefit and certainly it inspired the people to name their city, but clearly the gold mines were what attracted all of these colonists. However, Philip quickly understood that he wanted access to these gold mines rather than the Thasians, so he decided to conquer the city, 
and he captured it within a mere four years of its foundation and renamed it as Philippi. The city was able to retain a good deal of autonomy under Philip's rule. It had an assembly for the citizens and presumably had a reasonable amount of local government. Despite the fact that most of the buildings at Philippi were Roman period, there are still Greek walls, a theater, and a temple for some hero cult which still stand in Philippi to this day. The graves, houses, the forum, and all of the Christian churches, of course, come from later periods. By and large, Philippi is a better example of Roman architecture than of Greek. Nonetheless, it still has some Greek features, and it's more that the Romans continued to supplement and build upon what the Greeks had rather than that they started over in any sense. So it's a good example of a hybrid Greco-Roman city. And you know how much I hate that label Greco-Roman, but in this case, it actually works. Here's a view of some of the ruins of Philippi from up high, so you can get a good sense of the scope of what you're seeing. This would have been a pretty uh, good mix of the Greek and Roman stuff left there. Of course, the major space in the middle was the forum, the large town square. Basically, a forum is the Roman equivalent of a Greek agora. Um, another quick note on Philippi, this is indeed the city which lent its name to the Battle of Philippi between Caesar's assassins and his heirs, Mark Antony, and the young Octavian, who later became the Emperor Augustus. That's part of the reason why Augustus decided to lavish imperial support and largesse on the city, is to commemorate his great victory over Brutus and Cassius. Back to Potidaea. So the city was destroyed and absent from 356 on, and therefore the site was available. So Cassander decided he needed to build a couple of new cities, and he was looking hopefully to establish one that he could possibly make his capital. So he went to the site of Potidaea and founded Cassandria. Cassandria was intended to become one of the chief cities of Macedon, and it did okay. It didn't quite live up to Cassander's expectations, but it had a pretty good life. There was a canal cut through the Palene Peninsula by the Macedonians to really facilitate and further the importance of Cassandria. However, for the most part, Cassandria was more or less the chief naval base of Macedon rather than the capital city. And it would reach its peak as a naval base under Philip V, another Antigonid ruler who reigned from 221 to 179. Next up, we have perhaps the most famous city in Macedon, at least today, Thessalonica. Sometimes it's spelled with an I at the end, but looking at the Greek, the E is actually a little bit more accurate as a transliteration. This city was founded soon after Cassandria, also by Cassander, and it was founded to honor his wife Thessalonica. Thessalonica needed to be honored because she was a daughter of Philip II, a half-sister of Alexander, and therefore Cassander's Argeid link. This was what gave him his legitimacy. Now, Thessalonica was intended to be strategically important, and hopefully it prospered, but really it was a way for Cassander to sop public opinion in order so that way people would think that he's honoring the memory of the Argeids. Of course, he damages that idea later by killing Alexander IV, but what was he really going to do? Hand over the throne that he had helped to build? <laughs> no. Um, so anyway, over time, the city grew to be the most important Macedonian city, and by the time that Macedon fell to the Romans, it was already well on its way to being just that. During the Roman period, Thessalonica was one of the largest Christian centers. There was a large and active church community in the city. For most of Byzantine history, and this is true from the time of the fall of the West forward for several centuries, Thessalonica will be the second city of the empire, and it won't be all that close. So first you have Constantinople, and then second you have Thessalonica. The problem with Thessalonica, from the perspective of trying to study it as an ancient or even Hellenistic foundation, is that the constant habitation means that most of the ancient ruins here are Roman rather than Greek. For instance, to the left is the Rotunda of Galerius from the 4th century CE. 
Galerius was one of the Tetrarchs, and he was a rival of Constantine the First. One of the reasons why Thessalonica was able to remain such an important city throughout the Byzantine period is because it was well defended, and much like Constantinople, its defenses were a product of late antiquity rather than the Middle Ages. The Thessalonica walls were built around 390 CE. This would have been under the reign of Theodosius I. So uh, this is what accounts for a lot of its longevity is just being well enough defended that it didn't get completely devastated during the invasions of late antiquity in the early Middle Ages. Oh, uh, side note, P.S. Gabrielle from Xena Warrior Princess is said to be from the city of Potidaea, which we studied earlier. So if you don't take away anything else from this video, make sure that it's that one fact. That's what you really needed to know, and that's why I made this entire video, is just to convey that one fact. That's all I have. Next time, we will talk about something else.